I don't know who needs it. Did you do? Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It's December 3rd, 2015. May I have the attendance, please? Yep. Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Ms. Cardo? Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 4.0, executive sessions. Do I have a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA, subsection 4056D, to discuss the bargaining contract between the board and the Scarborough Custodians and Food Service Specialists and 4.2, a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1, MRSA subsection 405-6A to briefly be updated on personnel matter to return to public session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Very good. Seven. We are adjourned to public
and we are returning from uh, executive session at this time. And we're looking at 5.0. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. 6.0 is the superintendent's report. So I have um, uh, some brief comments, and then I'm going to be introducing David Creech. Um, I think it's important for the board to know that the Leadership Council uh, continues working diligently on the 24-month student-centered learning uh, work that we shared with you at the very last school board meeting. Uh, the Leadership Council has actually uh, just this week um, redeployed ourselves so that we might spend a little bit more time on designing and developing the student-centered learning system. Um, that we believe is, will best meet the needs of uh, our Scarborough students. Um, so this is now a, a bit of a, uh, a more accelerated initiative, um, and we recognize that we still need to stay the course in terms of supporting and refining the work of our professional learning teams and moving forward on the uh, performance evaluation and professional growth system that we're piloting. Um, so we're, we're tweaking our our own efforts and again uh, redeploying a, a bit in terms of our own PLTs that we work in um, and um, and you know we'll keep you posted on, on how that work is going. Uh, though there were some delays in uh, launching some of our standing councils, um, the Health Safety Security and Wellness Team, the Scarborough Schools Arts Council and the Scarborough School and Business Partners are all scheduled to meet within the next week or two. Um, that will ensure that our efforts um, are up and running uh, for some important uh, regular events that we have coming up and that are sponsored by these groups and planned for the spring of, of 2016. Um, I, I, you know, it goes without saying that there's tremendous work uh, that's happening across all of our schools, all of our phases and departments. Uh, but that said, um, I think it's particularly important um, as does the leadership at the Scarborough High School, um, that the board um, be updated on some important initiatives uh, uh, underway at the high school. And I've asked David Creech to take the rest of my report time. Uh, David is going to uh, talk about some of what's happening uh, uh, at the high school in terms of work that's been underway for uh, quite a, a period of time. Um, and these are um, related to the schedule development of the high school um, and some new initiatives related to both advisory uh, time and instructional support services. So uh, I will introduce David. And I think he has, yes, he has a PowerPoint. Thank you, Dr. Antwistle. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity for um, allowing me to come and talk to you a little bit about some exciting work we're doing at the high school. Uh, as Dr. Entwistle mentioned, we, this is work that has uh, been almost two years long, over three school years. Uh, extremely important work. Um, and we felt, as Dr. Entwistle mentioned, that it's, uh, we're at a crucial point where board and community awareness of what's happening and the impact on students, uh, it's perfect timing for that. So what I have for you is there's a packet in front of you. Um, so it has uh, each of the PowerPoint slides. So if you want to take notes or uh, put yourself in a position, if you want to ask questions on various parts of the presentation, you can do that. Uh, and I'll always preface any of my presentations with the fact that <coughs> the transitions between slides tend to be the highlight of my presentation. So you might want to watch those carefully. <coughs> So an overview of the process, uh, here are some of the key components that I'm going to discuss with you tonight and hopefully give you enough information to feel comfortable with the entire process uh, and actually beginning with why are we developing a new schedule and what's our rationale. Thank you. <laughs> so um, let's, let's start by talking a little bit about our rationale for the schedule development. So. In year one, in 2013, 2014, my first year as a principal, um, we talked extensively as a, as a high school staff about creating a culture of reflection. And any good educator on a regular basis is going to reflect on their current practices. And is what I'm doing what's best for students? And if not, how do I adjust what I'm doing so that I'm pr providing the most positive and most successful opportunities for students to learn? So, we try to embrace that as a staff and as a, an organization. 
So part of the work is based on the fact that we were really reflecting on what we had in place as an organization. We are developing, we had developed at that point and have, as a district come up with a student-centered learning focus. So was our schedule a student-centered learning focus or was it based on other needs, um, organizational needs or other constraints? We also felt it important that even though our primary focus is student-centered learning, it's always important to balance that with the, need, the resources and support staff need to do their job well and to improve student learning. And also, uh, there's, uh, I'm going to talk in a minute about the stakeholder feedback and input that I received the, the first uh, two years. Stakeholders in the school community, community members, parents, students, staff, counselors. Um, it was widespread and it was often. And at the very end, uh, it's really important that our schedule, as we reflect, it supports our academic programs and services we have in place. And not just the programs we have in place now, but those programs that perhaps we want to put in place for our students. So that's part of the rationale for our schedule development. Some background for our existing schedule. This schedule was created in 1990. For those of you without a calculator, that is 25 years. And during that time, the only modifications have been perhaps the length of time in classes or the transition time in between. So our current schedule, and I'm not going to try to explain it to you because I have to refer to the student handbook to figure <laughs> out which day we're on in my third year, but we have five periods a day and a seven-day rotation. And the essence of that is, is over seven days, a student will, will attend a specific class five times. That rotation changes from day to day. In our student handbooks, we have what day it is and what classes they meet and they know the times. So, Students have organizational pieces in place to support them, as do adults that I refer to. Our current class time ranges between 66 and 69 minutes, and our graduation requirements are important to note here because right now our graduation requirements are 21 credits. We're in a transition as a state in terms of proficiency-based diplomas and what graduation requirements are going to be. So we have to have a schedule that's going to be able to support whatever types of changes we make as a school. So a little background about our existing schedule. The feedback that I was referring to earlier. A part of my entry plan as a new principal was I sent invitations out to all stakeholders, parents, <coughs> students, staff, and I asked them to come and meet with me the summer before school and throughout the school year. Three things were the components of every single conversation I had. What does Scarborough High School do really well? What is the major challenge that we need to face? and what can I do as a principal to support you? Overwhelmingly, and I took all these notes down and I, I electronically captured all of those, the amount of stakeholders that came to me and talked to me about the schedule and the challenges their students faced because of that schedule was, was really eye-opening my first year. I had a parent advisory group that met on a regular basis. That theme seemed to come up on a regular basis and oftentimes it was <coughs> seniors' parents. What can you do for us? Our son or daughter can't take this class because of the, light, the size of the schedule. We, what are you doing to, to, um, to help adjust what's happening? And so obviously, the community dialogue with another piece. In the community dialogue, frequently we get feedback in terms of what our students are able to take for academic programs and whether what we have for a schedule supports that. And then finally, the number of conversations that happened when a student came into my office or a counselor or a teacher, one of the school leaders or a parent, saying, we need your help. My daughter can't take band because she needs this class for college. She's had band for three years. What do we do? It's, it was just a prevalent theme. So that feedback prompted us to go to the next step. Wow. Nice Impressive. Honeycomb. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, you have to wait. They get better. I let it build. So in 2013, 2014, my first year, once this stakeholder feedback made it very prevalent, to the leadership team and I that we needed to look at this, we, we formed a committee and we thought it was important that the committee be representative of all the different content areas. So that committee was formed, Mr. Legage and Mr. Dunn were the, were the school leaders that ran that committee and the first year was just let's, let's do what we've been saying we should do as professionals, let's examine our existing schedule and take a look at if it meets the needs of our students. We might find that it's fine. We just need to tweak it a little bit. We might find we need to overhaul this whole thing and start over. So the first year was spent examining the schedule and determining what should we have in place to support our students. It was determined at the end of that year by that committee that our schedule indeed needed to change. 
Year two, the focus was, let's go out and research best practice models out there for high-performing schools, not just in the state of Maine, but nationally. So we looked at data. There are actually, uh, there are actually groups that are paid to go to school systems and develop the schedule for them. An enormous amount of research and data on all the different types of schedules, uh, the benefits and challenges to them, and, and success stories and stories of schools that have implemented certain things that did not work well. That research was at uh, the cornerstone of the work that was done in the second year. From that research and from the criteria that we had talked about the year before, we came up with what we thought were the things that had to be in a schedule at Scarborough High School for our students in order for them to be successful. Student-centered schedule supports the needs of the staff for resources and it had everything that we believe that should be in place. At the end of last year, we created a process for how we're going to select the actual model we're going to use. Because as you know, there are so many different variations of models out there that we had to choose from. That process was basically this. We have three committees. We have a schedule development committee. It was determined that uh, an advisory program needed to be started. We have an advisory program committee. And we had also determined that we wanted to insert academic support time and embed it actually in the school day. Scarborough High School students are high-powered students whose lives are extremely busy. We found that despite their best efforts, it was really hard for them to get support before school, after school because of their activities. If their teacher's prep wasn't at the same time they had study hall, it was a challenge. So we saw some models that actually embedded academic support time into the schedule. So that was the third committee we created. Each committee has at least one or two members of every content area represented there. And then Lizzie and Emma organized at least two dozen students, student leaders in the school, to be a part of those committees as well, so we'd have student representation. That's what we've been doing this year, and during this process, we've basically broken it down and found two models that meet our needs. And so what do we do with those two models? It's not a checklist of, yes, I want this, no, I don't want this. Each each of the committees have to take a look at the benefits and the challenges of each model. And so I'm going to sh talk to you just briefly about the process we went through. So I'm not going to highlight all of those, but I'll let you know that I've tied the goals from our 24-month student-centered learning plan to each of the components of that new schedule. That it's a student-centered learning focus, um, all four of the goals are tied around student-centered learning. The advisory program works for goal two, the academic support time for two of our goals. And it was really important, one ingredient I had mentioned is increased flexibility and capacity because that's what prevented a lot of students from being able to take those courses either they needed to take or they wanted to take because it was something they cared about or it made them a more well-rounded student. So the increased flexibility and capacity was a major component. And then of course supporting our existing academic programs and what if we want to add some programs? We didn't have a schedule that gave us that kind of capacity. So those are our key components. It's my daughter's favorite, the airplane. Some of you missed that because you were looking down, so let me go back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what I've provided for you, and, and I, at any point, if you ever wanted to individually talk to me, I could do this for you, but I'm just going to show you the two models. I'm not going to go into any detail other than to tell you this. This first model is a five-period model. It's similar to our existing model in that there's five periods in a day. The difference is, is that this model inserts academic support time or the advisory program for 35 minutes into the schedule, which our current schedule does not have. Class times are now not going to be 66 to 69 minutes if we use this model. They'll all be 60 minutes. So over the course of the eight-day period we look at, we're looking at a total uh, of five-day period, excuse me, 300 minutes of instructional time in this existing model. What does five-period, eight-day rotation mean? It means that every day there's five periods, we rotate the schedule, and over an eight-day time, every student has met with that class five times. But now we have an eight-day schedule, so they can take another class. Now there are eight choices for students and not seven. So very similar <coughs> to our existing model. <laughs> wow. I missed that one. Oh, I missed it too. <laughs> <laughs> That is the crowd favorite. <laughs> so, and my youngest daughter's as well. So, the alternate block schedule. This is one that is different than our schedule and would um, really put us in a position where we would have to get some supports in place for our staff to become accustomed to this. 
This, by the way, is very prevalent in a lot of successful schools in the state of Maine right now. This is called an alternate block schedule. This schedule is an every other day block schedule. So what that means is on one day, for our school, it would be red and white. So on a red day, a student would have four possible classes they could take with the academic support time and advisory inserted. The next day, they have four different classes. And so over the period of the same amount of time we talked about before, there's still 300 minutes of instructional time. Uh, the challenges and benefits are listed for both of those. They're lengthy, so I'm not going to go, that in, go into detail with you on that. But I will tell you that at first glance, this particular model and having a daughter who is living this model right now, significantly less stress for students in a day. You're not prepping for five quizzes or tests or homeworks a day, four at the most. Most of the time it's three. And it's an every other day, so if you think about our academic, and I'm not, I'm not pushing for this one, but just describing this one a little bit differently because it's different than our existing program. If I have a class on a Monday and I have a math assignment and I do that work that night and I'm struggling with anything, the next day I don't have that class, but during academic support time I can go see my math teacher and get the help I need for the, fo the following day. So there are some benefits to this schedule and there are benefits to the other schedule. But these are the two models right now that we have broken it down to. So what are our final steps? So here's the process that we've gone through. We took these models and we listed the challenges and benefits. We gave them to every single content area and we asked them in department meetings to come up with what they thought were their challenges and benefits as a content area. And they shared that with us. The next week in our faculty meeting, we broke them into interdisciplinary groups. So math teachers, science teachers, social studies teachers, there was a blend. They got to hear what other content areas thought were benefits to the schedule and challenges. We then had them <coughs> give all that information to it and we've captured all of that information. That was just finished in the last faculty meeting. We're going to take that <coughs> information and give it all back to the scheduling committee. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look at the challenges and be benefits to both schedules. So that's the next step in this process. In addition, Lizzie and Emma and I in January are going to be organizing um, for each grade level. We're going to pull them together. Uh, the ladies are going to explain to them what's been happening with the new schedule and the development. And then I'm going to show them briefly the two different models. And I'm going to list for them what the finalized benefits and challenges are to the models. And then we're going to allow, since they all have laptops now, and we can give them a survey, we're going to ask them to complete a survey by choice where they're sharing with us as students what they think the benefits and challenges would be to that schedule. Mm -hmm. And that will be the final piece of input uh, from the school stakeholders. And that's going to happen in January. Um, once all of that is shared with the leadership team, we then make a determination on the model that's going to be used. At that time, we share that with the school community. And then we go to the next step, which is we prepare for the implementation of that. So what do we have to do is we prepare for a new schedule. If it's a schedule that's a five-day, eight rotation, teachers don't have to do a lot of changing to that because it's 66 or 69 minutes to 60 minutes. So the instructional strategies they've already been using are still going to be beneficial. But if we go to the alternating block schedule, we have current teachers in our building, including myself, that have worked under that schedule, that we can use them as in-house resources to support staff as they learn how to use 75 minutes as opposed to 66 minutes. We could also utilize uh, resources from other schools, connect with all those other schools in the area that have been successfully implementing that alternate block schedule or whatever schedule we adapt and have our staff connect with their staff to learn what they're doing in the classroom to be successful. And then finally we can send staff members to schools to observe what's happening during those schedules. Um, and finally support the stakeholders during the transition time. These are things we've thought of as we're going through that process there are going to be things that perhaps we haven't thought of especially when we work with other schools who have implemented this. Uh, we'll take that feedback and provide whatever supports staff need. And that also includes, oh, well, I'm sorry, and that also includes students. My staff, this is their favorite transition because they know that means it's the end of whatever I'm saying. <laughs> uh, always do the curtain at the very end. So I wanted to share this with you because I think it's important for you to get a sense of what we do at the high school. At the beginning of the school year, the leadership team and I made it very clear that there were two huge goals for the high school. 
And aside from the district goal, which is a part of everything we do, everything that guides us is the student-centered learning focus. But we wanted to transition from a good school to a great school. We have great kids. We have a great staff. We're a good school. We are. We're not a great school yet. What do we do as a school to go from good to great is our theme. And every single time we do any work that's student-centered driven, at the end of whatever we're going over, I ask them, how is this transition us from a good school to a great school? So I'm going to ask you, how would this schedule development transition Scarborough High School from a good school to a great school? Can anybody answer that? Well, I think it would give our students more opportunities to be able to either take classes that they need to be able to go on to their future endeavor, whether it be, you know, community college, trade school, or job, um, as well as it would give them an opportunity to maybe try something that they wanted to try that maybe they don't necessarily Absolutely. Need. That was such a prevalent theme. Mr. Creech, I really wanted to take this art class, this photography class. I want to stay in band for the fourth year, but I can't. This is a graduation requirement, or I need this to get into that good college. What do I do? That is a prevalent theme. The, the new schedules, whichever two, one of the two we choose, gives them that opportunity. And so we're not turning kids away now from something they either need to take or want to take. That's one really good reason. Does anybody have any others? Great job, by the way. <laughs> you have another? I had to call on somebody else. I'm sorry. I have to spread the wall. Does anybody have another? Part that would, why this would go from good to great? Oh. Don't make me call on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the teacher. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think that it's showing us, uh, one of the things I've garnered from this is that the faculty is working more closely together to provide the education that our students need. And I think that the more that they work together in a <coughs> student-centered as ex uh, opposed to, uh, what do I want to say, curriculum-centered, sure. that it's going to benefit everybody, including them. I do have a question about that. I, I don't notice that there's anything there uh, or projected on integrated studies, which you know, the well, math I, and the science and... Sure. I, I mean, I could have gone to in a little more detail in that, but, the, you know, in one of those schedules, there's, there's uh, an opportunity to take a 75-minute block and do what they call skinnies. And skinnies okay. are where you insert smaller class time every day for students, and then you end up having... Some schools will have skinnies, like if they have an 80-minute block, they'll do two skinnies. You might have two humanity classes. One goes for 40 minutes, the other goes for 40 minutes, but they collaborate, and they do interdisciplinary work okay. in terms of themes. So... There, there's a lot of things like that that are benefits to some of those schedules. I just didn't want to go into too no, much detail. No, I just wanted to... But the byproduct of this work, you're absolutely correct. Our staff members are collaborating. They're using a student-centered approach. They're working with people that they typically don't work with. They're <coughs> learning about content area. It's a great way for a school to work collaboratively. So that is a, a good answer as well. Who wants to tell me how do you make a... So let me explain to you make a large school feel small. Scarborough High School is a large high school. It's the sixth largest school in the state of Maine by enrollment. Hmm. It is not only a big school, this is a powerful school. We have high-powered students who are great kids, who work very hard, and a staff that really challenges and pushes them. And we're big. And a lot of times kids and staff feel like, I'm a part of a big school. And that sometimes is not the best feeling when you're going to high school. So I've been trying to talk to my staff, how do we make a large school feel small? For instance, one thing we've done as a staff is every staff member has to stand out in the hallway between classes. They haven't had to do that in the past, not for discipline. Mm -hmm. So that students are seeing them connect with each other and they're modeling that kind of behavior. And then as, as the students come into your class, how are you doing? Great job last night in the play, whatever it is. And you're all of a sudden creating a connectedness for a large school that makes it feel like a small school. So that was an example of one small thing we did to go from a large school to a small school. What would the schedule do to help this large school feel like a small school? Or what part of the schedule? Well, you, for one thing, you have that advisory set up, right. which is daily, which is amazing. And in order to put that in, I'm wondering how many students per staff member that's going to be. Um, but also the academic support 
it's, right. it's going to be freedom to go get help where you need it, when you need it, every day. The opportunity is right there built into the day, which is awesome, I think. And that's absolutely, absolutely correct again. So an advisory program, a major component, mm -hmm. an adult in your life for four years that you make a connection with, somebody who's going to be there to support you. There's evidence that when you have connections with adults, positive connections, strong connections, it really helps students be successful. The answer to your question is 107 professionals for 1,034 students. We're looking at about 10 students in an advisory. We're also looking at tying the advisory at the same time as the academic support time, just on a different day, and keeping the same person in place. So not only would you have one advisor that's working with you, however frequently it is, once a week, once every two weeks or whatever, yeah. to go over the components of the advisory program, but you would go to that same person during the academic support time. That means you have 10 students, and those students get passes to go get the support wherever they need to, but that person can also be helping check their academic standing and provide academic counseling, like maybe you need to go see your social studies teacher or whatever. So but that the minute that that student shows up in the social studies teacher, they've got 11 now, right? Well, it depends. So all those, all those things haven't been taken care of yet. But basically, it's going to be teachers are going to have to manage. Uh, a student probably will not have to go unless they've been given a pass. So I'm going to know how many passes I've given to students to come and get help from me. Right. So those details are still in the works. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at one adult and about 10 students for the advisory piece. And if we keep that with the academic support time, <coughs> that means you have one adult managing 10 students in terms of their transitions. So I just wanted to um, share with you, this is what we do at the end of a fa every faculty meeting, how is this part helping us go from good to great and how we make a large school feel small. So <laughs> this part is for your questions. Well, the other thing is you have a facility that will allow you to make that smaller if you, if you really wanted to. In other words, when, when we did that renovation, every corridor is the same as the next. And so if you want just groups of students uh, in one area of the building from the majority of the day, you can do that. You're right. And, you know, that's at, over time, I think that's kind of shifted a little bit. I think they had that in place, and now you might not have all freshmen, because not all teachers teach just ninth graders or just right. seniors or whatever. So that has changed. But we do have that capacity. And don't get me wrong, I pinch myself every day. We have a fantastic facility, and we're very grateful for that resource. But we're trying to, do, to also just uh, help students and staff feel connected and feel like they're a part of a smaller school field. Just, and I think this schedule and the advisory program and the academic support really lends itself to, to that goal. Yes? I have a statement more than a question, which I know you love. Um, and I just kind of want to show my hand and say that I really think that only one of these is turning a good school into a great school, and that's the block scheduling. Um, and I think that there are a variety of reasons why, but, but one that you may not have thought of that I just want to offer to you is that increasingly colleges and universities are going to block scheduling. The 66 minute class does not exist in higher education, 75 minutes, 90. 180 absolutely does. And, you know, we, we tout this number that 90% of our seniors go on to higher education. We don't tout the number of how many of them finish a baccalaureate or a master's degree. Um, and so much of student success, especially that first year in college, is dictated by a student's ability to make that transition from high school to college. And I think a block scheduling model will just make it that much more likely and possible. And I think that that's really important. And, and thank you for pointing that out. That is something that we notice too. And, and also, and uh, research will tell you there's not one schedule that's the best schedule for all different types of learners. We know that. But with the alternating block schedule, and I mentioned skinnies, that's the data, that's what they call them. I shouldn't be calling anything skinny. But they, what they do in that is they basically, you can have the every other day 75 minutes or 80 minutes, but then if you have a learner that can't be successful every other day for 80 minutes and would benefit from maybe 40 minutes every day, you can insert skinnies into that. And so we would be, as a school, trying to figure out which courses and which students would best benefit from that. And it has the flexibility to not only do what you just said, which is prepare students for ultimately the type of schedules they should have, but insert some of that type of class that some of our students would benefit from more. So that, that's a great point. Thank you. Yes? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend I'm Jackie for a minute and tell you back in the day, because <laughs> I was in, it was block scheduling when I was in high school. They tried it one year. It was 1990, 91. 
It was my sophomore year, and we did block scheduling in Scarborough. And it was 80 minutes, mm -hmm. or maybe even a little bit longer. But there was not the flexibility for kids who couldn't handle sitting in a class right. for 80 minutes. It just, for some classes, was very <coughs> difficult. And I know um, it was a struggle sometimes in math classes. I mean, education was very different then. You literally sat while a teacher was at the wasn't chalkboard. the whiteboard. It was the chalkboard. chalkboard or an overhead, yeah. like squeaking on the overhead transfers. But it was, and that's the way we learned. But I can see so many amazing possibilities with the longer <laughs> block periods, especially for interdisciplinary work, because we did do some of that. I remember there was a health class in biology for, I don't know if it was four or six weeks, we did, we worked together with mm. the health class and did um, big projects where we had the time to actually work on it and do real research instead of just, well, you have five days and you're only going to have 45 minutes and it was really a lot of work. It was, they were impressive projects by the time it was done. So now with the technology available and with a real focus on interdisciplinary work in all courses, I think this could be really amazing. And I'm not saying that the other one wouldn't be great, but I just think that the block scheduling, um, just like Kate said, I think it's the one that could really jump it to the next level. And you know, the, the chat, you're right, it, it does have a, I think it provides the flexibility, like you said, for students if they do need to meet. It, but it is a challenge for a school that hasn't had that type to identify what are the courses that would fall into that, what learners would best benefit from that, because w that's a challenge. That's difficult because we have an expansive, as you know, right. program of studies in identifying which courses. And if you go into a skinny, that, t that really is limiting how many classes you can take, too. Right. because. Right. So there are, there are benefits to it and there are some challenges too, but we think we can, <coughs> we think we can take those challenges and make them positive. Yes? When, when you've looked at all the different models and you said that you've um, searched around and you've talked to people at different schools, are there any that say have tried the one way with like the eight days rotation and then they said, you know what, that really didn't work for us, so we've jumped now to this block or vice versa? Uh, a, a few, not, not a lot of that. I mean, we, uh, we have teachers in our building that taught at CAPE. CAPE has right now um, six periods a day over, set over eight. And so ours would be five over eight. So we've had teachers that have done that. We've talked to them. We, we understand um, how it can be successful in that type of program. And then we've talked to, obviously, and looked at the data um, from not just one or two schools that we speak to, but these data compa these companies that collect all this data, they list the benefits from all these high-performing schools where it's been successful. They have percentages on graduation rates and absenteeism and all of that. So we've really tried to look broader than just the state of Maine, but we have had hands-on conversations with uh, and we've had teachers in our, in our building that have benefited from the types of schedules that we're looking at right now. We have in-house resources that can say, this does work in this, this doesn't work in that. So we've used that information too. There's one more question, and yes. it's sort of with regards to Late Start Wednesdays. And so if Late Start Wednesdays are to continue, I know that right now you drop off one class and you rotate through them. So that it's, is that right? That's how my daughter explained it. <laughs> so if you want to know what would happen if we had a late start, right. there would be no academic, uh, well, this is a, a proposal, of course, we haven't decided this or not, but we would want to make sure that whatever time was left in that day was all instructional time. So okay. if it's the alternating block schedule, there's still four classes that are just shorter. Okay. If it's the five day over eight, there's going to be four because there's a morning group of classes that rotate and there's an afternoon group of classes that rotate. And we have to do that because we have vocational schools and we have okay. students that go to AM Voc and PM Voc. Okay. So they would go from four to three in the morning and from three to two in the afternoon. Okay. If it was the five day. All right. So you've already we obviously have, all have those questions that. already popped up into your We have, but that's still a good question. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh Emma, you had a question, right? Yeah, um when you were talking about graduation requirements and now that we're we're gearing up to transition to the proficiency based diplomas, do you know credit-wise what the graduation requirements are for that or how that works really or is that more of a question for the board? No, we, we don't. No, you asked the right person. So, um, <laughs> so the Department of Education gives the local, uh, local school districts the ability to decide. We, they have standards that we have to meet, but we can look at the content areas and decide what standards our students have to meet in the eight content areas. So the part that's going to be the most challenging for us, it's a challenge for every school, is 
Some schools go to just standards-based grading. Some schools stay with a current grading system the way it is. Some schools have both. You have grades and then you have the standards that were met and you also incorporate the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. Each school is allowed to decide what model they're going to use. So we don't have our graduation requirements for that yet. We're at the early stages of that and we have a two-year extension with the Department of Education uh, that really respect the way that we're going about uh, our decisions on this. But um, what this does do in terms of the graduation requirements is, I'll give you one example. Um, if we decide that foreign languages, which should be a graduation requirement, is inserted with that extra capacity, you know, it gives kids an opportunity to take that foreign language class if they haven't typically taken it in the past, that extra capacity and flexibility. So this schedule lends itself to help us if our graduation requirements are tweaked and maybe a little bit more um, demanding than what they currently are. Yes? I know you talked briefly about the academic block of time that students will have to go off to, to different classes and that there'll be about 10 students to one teacher. Is there an opportunity there for maybe a few more kids with fewer teachers and provide time, which we know is of the essence for our staff, to collaborate in some way during that block of time? Um, well, you know, you still will have your study halls. We still have as one of our goals to try to create a schedule that allows content areas to have teachers who teach the same courses to collaborate, okay. to have the same prep period. That's, that's generally a byproduct of how the content area is organized, who teaches what classes, and so we've been working on that last year and we're going to work on it this year to start moving towards maybe these three people are teaching grade nine English classes. And so we would try to find a way to embed common prep time into the schedule itself. In terms of, and so that's for the collaboration piece. In terms of working with a smaller group of students and doing that piece, you still have your resource rooms and your study halls. We still have our study center, which is a, an extremely effective tool for kids to get extra help. We still have all of those that will remain there. This academic support time, it, it, it benefits every kind of student. The student who's struggling on a regular basis and needs that check-in with the teacher, the students who are really busy and can't find time before or after school to go and get help, every student would benefit from that 35 minutes a day for academic support time. There's some details, though, as I mentioned, we're, we're still ironing out the details. That's the process that's going to be finishing up in the next couple of months. Anyone else? Yes. Lizzie. Lizzie. Um, so as someone who has had the opportunity to go to schools that utilize both scheduling uh, models, is there any, like, one particular obstacle that is faced with each schedule, like, as Scarborough High School to switch to either one, like, the big Sure. Um, I would say the, for me and what I've heard from, because I've been involved in all of these conversations, one of the biggest challenges to the five period, eight day rotation is the amount of stress it places on a student. There's a lot of transitions during that day. Every class you've been in, you know there's a startup time and an ending time in that class. You get 35 minutes of transition time that we think is lost when you have five classes in a day and an advisory time. So because you're getting five minutes passing time, instead of being in a class and learning, you're transitioning to another class, you're starting up in this class, then you're winding down in that class. So transitions at times create a more stressful and it sometimes uh, you don't get the depth in a class that you might possibly get if you had a longer period of time with fewer transitions. So that's one of the major obstacles. And imagine on your rotating schedule, there's one day where you have five quizzes. You know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes teachers have a day where they're teaching the whole day. They don't have a prep or a duty because the rotation that day is five classes. So that's the major, I would say, one of the major drawbacks for that one. A major drawback for the alternating block schedule, and, and I, was a, I taught in this system, and I can remember this was a challenge, but our academic support time, I think, is going to be a way to uh, mitigate that. If you have an alternating block schedule, and I had you for a class on a Wednesday, the next time I'm scheduled to see you is on... Friday. Friday, but you're absent from school. When's the next time I see you? <coughs> Tuesday. That's six days in between, and that's a long time 
between seeing students. And so in a lot of classes, the frequency at which you, meet, you see students, especially math, foreign language, and some of those others, you really need to see them frequently for students to be successful. So what happens during that six days when you're out? And that, that's a big challenge for alternating block. What we think would mitigate that would be the academic support time. So you come back to school on Monday and you schedule time to go see your teachers, find out what you missed, and we also think a mitigating factor is our new technology. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our teachers use Google Classroom. So I'm out, but I can go into Google Classroom and I have the assessments that were done, the lessons that were taught, I can connect with my teacher in real time, get feedback, what did I miss? So we think those two pieces would mitigate the, the challenge of if you were out one day, so much distance between the time you've met with your teacher. But great question. Thank you. Christine? It's more of a comment, but as was pointed out earlier, it's very similar to a college schedule. Mm -hmm. Right. So just like if you're in the college class and your class meets Tuesday and Thursday, you're not seeing the teacher again until the next Tuesday. So, I mean, it, it sort of prepares them, and maybe it's better preparing them sooner rather than as you're sending them out the door. And the flip side of that is there are students who absolutely need to see a teacher just about every day for a smaller amount of time. They learn better in smaller chunks of time. The frequency of, and the reinforcement of seeing that teacher and going over that, uh, those instructional strategies, it, it helps some learners. So the bottom line is there's not one schedule that's best for all kinds of learners. We're hoping that one of these schedules will have the ability to insert some components that will meet the needs of all learners. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Just a, just a quick uh, comment, David. Um, I'm, I'm not asking a question, but um, in answering your question, which is um, what's in it for kids, I think that uh, lots of folks would be surprised that what's in it for kids is an opportunity to be more well-rounded because we have, we have um, some arts and, and more liberal arts opportunities for kids where we have empty seats because of the existing schedule mm -hmm. and and kids who really want to be in there but who can't be in there and I think what also would surprise people are the number of kids that get turned away from our higher level classes because they're limited in terms of size and and this creates the this this basically accommodates the opportunity to to build those pieces um, so that we're truly meeting the needs of of our students and and um, so this, I think you did an excellent job of, of uh, explaining these. I, I get a sense that there's a little bit of a bias, uh, one or the other. Uh, <laughs> the good news is that we're going to bust open what exists now, and either way is going to be better than the way that it is right now. So thank you for your presentation. I thought it was really good. Thank you. And, and I just do want to compliment you too, David, because the, a lot of hard work and discussion went into this. It takes a lot of time to have Conversations with staff the size that you have and include the students too in the discussions that are happening. This is a lot of work and I'm thrilled to see <coughs> it moving forward like this. I'm, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 7.0, the Chia's report, and I just have a few things for you. One is a reminder to uh, our new standing committees to uh, make sure uh, you take a minute to notify Kelly Johnston about when you're going to meet so that it can get posted, so request that it gets posted so that we can get those meetings underway and it's all nice and clear to everyone in the community. The second one is that Jackie, Jackie and I attended the um, Drummond Woodson workshop on arbitration. It was only a half hour, a half a day long, but it covered a lot, a lot of information. It, it truly is amazing. Uh, once you begin talking about and understanding negotiations and the next level of arbitration, is just a lot to know, as you know, Ms. Murphy, right? So yes, we have you to rely on. <laughs> And the third thing is that the superintendent does have a letter that uh, we are in receipt of, and I would like to ask him to read that letter. Sure. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, dear Chair Bealey and members of the Scarborough Board of Education, it's with some mixed emotions that I advise you in writing today 
What I told Mrs. Bealey yesterday and what she subsequently shared with you, meaning the board, which is that my intent, uh, which is that it is my intent to retire from Scarborough Public Schools and from public K-12 education effective the end of the 2015-2016 school year. As of the end of June 2016, I will have proudly served as Scarborough's superintendent of schools for the last five years. During this time, I've had the privilege of working with a fine staff of educators and educational leaders, teachers, leaders, and support staff that are worthy of the highest levels of community pride and positive professional regard. My retirement announcement at this time is my deliberate effort to support the Board of Education in getting the very earliest start that they can in finding the next superintendent for the Scarborough schools. A forward momentum of continuous improvement has been underway for these last five years. And we are seeing our students and our staff grow and develop in extraordinary ways. For, for those who believe that merely adequate or status quo efforts on behalf of Scarborough students are good enough, it's important to know that the community's educators, our 3,000 plus students, their parents, their grandparents, their future colleges, and their future employers just do not agree. Simply good enough is not the return on investment that these stakeholders will accept. It is my belief that this superintendent opportunity in Scarborough, Maine will attract a strong and capable leader who can continue and advance the important work of rebuilding the Scarborough schools so that over the next five years, Scarborough schools will take their rightful place as one of the top performing schools in New England. I will continue to and support, I will, I will continue and support the selection process in whatever ways the board may request my assistance. I want to thank the Board of Education and certainly all of my colleagues for their support, encouragement, good humor, which has been very important, uh, and respect. My wife, Nancy, who is a 20 plus year school public school professional and I are ready and very excited to move on to new pursuits and for our family June of 2016 is the perfect time for our next adventure to begin. So thank you. Do we have any comments from the board at this time? Yes, I'll go first. I'm sure, sure others will speak up. I just want to wish you luck and, and have enjoyed um, the last three years or two years, however long, it seems like forever, um, <laughs> that we've worked, that we've worked together. I, I think Scarborough is, is losing a top-notch superintendent and, and I appreciate the fact that you're providing us this news early so we can go out and, and find another top-notch. Um, superintendent. So thank you for all your, your work in, in really moving the school district in the right direction. And have fun come June of 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Jackie. I'm not saying a word about it tonight. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> thank you for your comment. <laughs> Christine? Well, first I might say that uh, there will be some big shoes left behind to fill for whoever to come sit in that chair over there. So thank you. And uh, I guess we'll have more things on the next sure. We've got a whole year. Month, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you have been the, you got hired right before I got elected. So you're uh, the, you're the superintendent as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, <coughs> I just, you and know. will continue to be. Yeah. You have had, um, a huge impact on the school district and I'm sure that you'll help us find somebody great but you need to make sure that they continue the dance routines for the opening of school <laughs> so <laughs> you, if you need to do some choreography training or whatever it is you may be surprised to know that it's not actually me <laughs> we would not be surprised by that you're the boss yeah. so that needs to continue mm -hmm. thank you 
Anyone else? We're not saying goodbye tonight. I know. Oh. All right. These are all the job requirements for the yeah. future. He needs to make sure they right. can sing and dance. <laughs> thank you. Yes. I would just like to thank you for making my experience so far on the board really educational and really just an amazing experience. And thank you for all the work that you've done over the years. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, you know, and I just wanted to point out a few things too for the for the um, community to to remember and for all of us to recall too. So this has been outstanding leadership that we've had for five years. Remember, uh, I've been here 35 years, and I don't recall another superintendent that had community-wide forums in order to develop the goals of the system. Am I wrong, Mrs. Sackmore? Mm -hmm. I, I don't recall anyone else who did it this way, where we actually had hundreds of community people come to a forum to attend and come up with what they wanted to see in education, and then an administration that went back and developed plans and goals and directed uh, the future of what was going to happen in the schools. So that's one significant thing. Um, also, the the really important work you and I don't see. It, it's not up here. You know, it's it's not what we're doing. It's what's happening Monday through Friday in the schools. And what has been happening is amazing work. You look at that uh, the engagement of our of our staff in what is called learning communities, giving them opportunities to look at the data and analyze current research and take a look at it, apply it to what they're doing in the classroom and make changes in the classroom. That's at the heart, I think, of what has been happening here over the past five years. That's, that's huge, huge for, for me. Um, the encouragement into the community of the Education Foundation, something I don't recall happening here before in the past as well. We have a group out there that's collecting money, aside from the school budget, they're collecting money to use on innovative ideas in this community. And that has come through from Dr. Entwistle as well. Um, he's hired many, many people in the past five years that have all uh, come to fruition and turned out to be great educators and working with our students. Um, I'd say he set wonderful goal, goals for himself that he has met or exceeded, and the latest of which has been the UNIBE work, the, uh, you know, the bringing of um, interns, uh, college students from the Dominican to Scarborough this fall. That has been wonderful. Our young kids have been exposed to another language terrific work. So I think, you know, um, among those of us who sit here, none of us hired him except for Jackie. So thank you, Jackie, for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for those in our community who did sit on the board and hired, you know, and hired Dr. Entwistle, they made an exceptionally good decision. So thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Very good. Well, we have all year, so we'll Absolutely. be putting leaping, heaping praises on you. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love that when it happens. 8.0 committee reports. Jackie? Uh, you will all have on your email today a report. A message from main school boards about uh, what is it the elementary and secondary education act of 1965 called the student success act uh, has been updated and it what it does is it updates no child left behind mm -hmm. and it has passed overwhelmingly in our house of representatives and has moved on to the senate senate it's a huge document, and I started to read it this afternoon, and I said, it's going to take me weeks, and it's going to take each of us weeks to go through that document, but we're going to have to do that uh, 
so that we can move forward with our plans here in Scarborough so that we know how we're going to meet what is necessary uh, from the federal government. So I encourage you over the next few months, actually, to really delve into that document. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep you updated from MSMA on, on the Senate vote as well. But it looks like it's going to pass. Hmm. That's all. Uh, that's all I have at the moment. Terry, do you have? Yes. Um, the communications committee met today at 1:30, and I want to apologize for not getting that information out sooner. Just getting my feet underneath me now, I know, knowing half the battle. So, um, we agreed that our next meeting will be Monday, December 21st at 1:45, which is a change from um, what we had thought before. Um, we discussed guidelines for committee meetings for our committee meetings going forward and agreed that we would allow five minutes for public comment should anyone from the public want to come and be heard. Um, we discussed the possibility of resurrecting the school board newsletter, uh, something that could be subscribed to through email um, in more of a newsletter format rather than just an email format. Um, and that's a work in progress that we'll keep talking about. Um, we discussed uh, taking a more active role in, dissemin in disseminating information to our local media outlets by putting together press releases when appropriate. And finally, we agreed to continue to use our Facebook page to put out important information, um, but we were talking about how we would like to share more of the amazing things happening at our schools, much like the student reports, um, and we'd like to get that out um, on Facebook page as well. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the facilities, uh, long range facilities planning uh, committee will be having a meeting sometime in January to discuss the findings of the report for our, um, I guess, I, in our enrollment projections and the community projections of neighborhoods, you know, mm -hmm. and what we've been looking at. There was some information that was needed from the town, so Dan Bacon was working with our people to kind of put it all together. So now we'll hopefully uh, have something coming forward sometime. January we'll have some meetings, and then February we'll probably have some more meetings, and hopefully we'll know what our town looks like demographic-wise. Great. Good. Jody? The Finance Committee met directly before our meeting here tonight, which will be standard procedure. We talked about um, setting goals. We reviewed last year's goals and plan to add um, to, to that list. We went over the schedule of how the budget is, is rolled out over the course of the year for new committee members and um, we will work on that over the next month. So in January we have um, a pretty good idea of how that will go forward in the spring. And I'll be reaching out to Town Council Sean Baybine to sort of start that process of working together again. I think we all agreed, and, and I know the Town Council has agreed that it worked well last year. We just need to do it more frequently and, and through the entire process rather than stopping sort of when things start to heat up and get busy. We need to make, make that time and find that time. So I will be reaching out to Sean and the Finance Committee for the Town Council. Yes, tell me. So the policy committee, um, much like finance, has been meeting um, just prior to our business meeting of the month. Policy is going to meet <coughs> just before our workshop meeting every month at 6 o'clock. Um, and going forward, that will be the standard. We might add meetings as policies come up that need to be pushed through a little faster or something that's come up that needs to be addressed. But um, going forward, we're going to have our meetings at 6 o'clock just prior to um, the third Thursday. Um, and just a couple words about the um, calendar committee that Carrie and I are going to be working on. Our, our first meeting is Tuesday the 8th at um, 7 o'clock in the multipurpose room of the high school. And we are still um, happy to accept anyone who is interested in serving on that committee. And I ask that there are people that haven't made up their minds one way or another, that they have an open mind about possibilities in the schedule. Um, just the regular calendar for the year going forward and then also 
um, once we kind of get a handle on that going forward and what might be the best um, daily schedule, I guess is what I, I would refer to it as, what time should school start for everybody. So we're still looking for some members and you can contact Kelly Johnston, send her an email and she can get you the appropriate information. But um, we are looking for people in the community and particularly um, parents that have kids through all phase levels because um, it obviously affects everybody, whether it's going to be late starts or it's going to be a different model and it's also a critical time to start talking about it because also um, the teacher contract is going to come up for um, negotiation this year too. So some things could all tie in together. So we're hoping to meet, well we are meeting Tuesday and we're hoping to maybe get two meetings in before the holidays and then um, really push through because we are hoping to have a recommendation to the full board by um, our meeting from February. So if you're interested, please contact Kelly Johnston. Very good. Thank you. And student representative reports. Emma, do you want to start? Um, do that first? Okay. Um, so for the middle school, uh, the Builders Club will be donating their time at Partners for World Health. It's um, an organization in Portland that donates not uh, health supplies and medical supplies that can't be used in American hospitals just because of regulations and things like that that are still perfectly usable to send out to third world countries. So they're going to be volunteering there. Um, also, students are going to be donating Beanie Babies from November 30th through December 11th to be shipped to orphans in other countries. Um, Lillian Finley has been organizing this effort for a couple years now and she's continuing this. Um, so there's a donation box located just outside the main office in the middle school and inside the main office at the high school. We'd like to extend a, a congratulations to the following students who qualified for the December 10th SMEML 6th grade math meet. For the first team we have Quentin Wu, Chris Lafferty, Reed Deniso, Holland Boyington, Diego Gatti, Ethan DeBias, and on the alternate team there's Dylan Labonte, Chris Kitty Raw Kitty Gross, Una Jeranovic, Katie Roy, Nathan Robinson, and Jack Simonton. The Interact Club Middle School branch is collecting crutches and other medical stabilizers to be sent to ver various countries in Africa. All 8th graders went to the Museum of Art to experience contemporary art from Maine and view the recovered Wyeth paintings. At the high school, the SHS Oak Hill players wrapped up their production of Anything Goes with huge success. I went to see it. Amazing work. I was blown away. Uh, the cast was very talented in their humor, their dancing, singing, and their acting. And I'd like to extend a special congratulations to our very own Lizzie Hobbs and some of the lead senior actors and actresses. Spencer Stewart, Hayden Jones, Sarah Griffin, and Abby Vafiatis. They should feel extremely proud of their work. It was an amazing show. Winter sports pick up this week. Uh, the swim team has their very first meet versus Cape Elizabeth tomorrow, Friday the 4th. And the basketball teams play at Westbrook Friday the 4th as well. So good luck to all the teams that are gearing up to start their seasons. Model UN will be hosting a movie night fundraiser that will be accompanied with a bake sale <coughs> next Friday, December 9th at the high school auditorium and doors will open at 6.30. Uh, lastly, an, NS, an SHS senior has been selected for an extremely prestigious position worthy of congratulations. Lexi Jamison has been selected as one of two students to represent Maine at the 2016 United States Senate Youth Program. So. Congrats to Lexi. She's highly deserving of this. She's a very great student and one of my great friends. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. Lizzie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually only have a few things to report from the Wentworth School. Um, they recently held a very successful garden fundraiser where they sold mums and other flowers at their open house. Uh, Wentworth students trick-or-treated for the UNICEF organization, which was organized by the K-Kids group. Uh, Wentworth students recently participated in a Stuff the Bus food drive, which was organized by the Purple and Red Learning Communities. And in addition, Wentworth also hosted a Scholastic Book Fair as well as Family Literacy Night. Very good. Thank you. 
10.0 recognition. Um, and they've been waiting patiently in the back, <laughs> thinking that this was going to quickly move through <laughs> to item 10, and little did you know how much you would leave knowing that you didn't think you would know. <laughs> uh, so thank you for staying, <laughs> staying with us. This is Nancy Jones from the course Parent uh, Boosters, and she has a, a couple of the booster officers with her. And, and so why don't you all get, come on up, introduce yourselves, and um, t tell us uh, the, the news. There's some recognition to be had. So my name is Nancy Jones, and I'm a parent of one recent alum of Scarborough High School, Colin, and then um, Hayden and Audrey, who are at the high school right now. And Hayden has already been mentioned once <laughs> tonight. I didn't realize that was going to happen. And along with Hayden and um, Sue Pru, the choral director, wrote a grant um, through Town & Country Federal Credit Union. It's called the Better, Better Neighbor Fund. And we were up against 15 other uh, nonprofit organizations um, for a grand prize of $5,000. And through all the efforts of the chorus, um, asking for votes for them and trying to get that balance between reminding people to vote and not being a nag, and having the support of the high school for that, um, we were awarded the $5,000 grant. And that was recently done in November. And we're using the grant money uh, for a trip to Chicago, for the chorus to go to Chicago and to sing um, and to attend some cultural events there, uh, as well as have some trainings as well. And they have had um, other chorus trips, um, which class officers are going to speak about. And um, we're just very proud of, of being awarded that grant. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, hi, I'm Sarah Griffin. Um, we were just going to talk a little bit about um, what these trips have meant to us in the past. Um, so our freshman year, we actually got the opportunity to go to New York City and we performed in the Festival of Gold there, which it gave us a really good experience of what it takes to um, actually perform in a competition choir, as well as it also gave us the opportunity to um, study briefly with um, a conductor down there who was very well known um, for his direct in, direction in choral arts. And we also got the opportunity to work with a Broadway choreographer in a brief workshop to kind of learn a little bit about performance and stuff. And then um, our sophomore year, we were able to go to Disney where we did another workshop and we got to perform in a much less formal but educational, a very different way um, type of performance. And it's bit just been wonderful for us. And then, yeah. did you want to say some short BC? Um, hello, I'm Rachel Matthews. Um, I'm a senior and I'm also an officer of the chorus along with Sarah. Um, but what this grant really means for us for this next year is that this is going to help us lower the cost for a lot of the students who have to pay. We all have to pay out of pocket for our trip and our way, pay our way. So it, it will really help us with, with airfare. We have to fly all the way out there. We need transportation while we're there. We need hotels. And it's, it's a multiple day trip, so it's, it's a pretty expensive uh, venture, but it's, it's well worth it. It's, I've been on trips for the last three years. I'm planning to go this year. Um, and as officers, we, we, we play a role in organizing fundraisers. We have multiple fundraisers every year. So this, um, so this new grant is really going to help lighten the load. And um, in Chicago, we're going to go. Last year, we went to uh, Washington, D.C., and we were able to perform for, at, the, at two national veterans' homes which was very um, exciting for me. My father's a veteran, it meant a lot to me. Um, and uh, we got to tour the, the Capitol, and this year with Chicago, we've never been to Chicago before, so this will help us really get new experiences, new, um, new little uh, workshops with different, different points of view. And a lot of us wouldn't be able to get this experience if we didn't have it through chorus, through the school and with all of our hard work. So it, it means a lot to us. Congratulations. Very good. Yeah, Very nice. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks so much for being patient. <laughs> Um, the other recognition, um, as uh, you probably probably saw on uh, some of the news clips, um, grades uh, K through 8 participated in the uh, Stuff the Bus, the 100.9 Stuff the Bus. And just as a follow-up note, um, well, I had heard that the bus, by the time it got to Wentworth, it was so stuffed that the high school students that were helping stuff the bus could no longer ride in the bus. There was only room for the driver <laughs> and, the, and the bus stuffers actually had to ride in another vehicle behind the bus. Uh, the grand total for the 10th annual Stuff the Bus food drive for Preble Street, which is awesome, um, was 127,509 pounds of food for, for Preble Street, including more than 52,000 of donated non-perishable food items on two school buses. Um, the mon monetary support allows Preble Street to purchase food at seven pounds per dollar, which accounts for the other 75,000 pounds of food. Um, and, the, and the comment <coughs> made was, trust me when I say it's easier to move $75,000 of money food than real food. <laughs> did, did, did you get that? <laughs> I'm just getting it now. So there's money food and there's real food, and the okay. money food is easier to move. Right. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, it, was it was fun. That, uh, I know that Wentworth made uh, a video, um, and so some of us got to see the stuffing of the bus, and it actually happened from the piles of food, and it was, it was a human chain of passing one to the next. It was really... Um, it was really a great effort on the part of the, uh, all of our K-8 uh, students. So that congratulations to them for such a, a, a good, good work for such a worthy cause. Awesome. That That's it. Yes. <coughs> Very good. 11.0, new business. 11.1. Uh, do we have a motion regarding the minutes of November 19th? Move approval is printed. Second. Any discussion, changes, corrections that anyone saw? No? Very good. All in favor? Seven plus two. 11.2, the first reading of policy GCBC, the employment of coaches and advisors. Um, Mrs. Murphy, do you want to speak to this first? Or? Sure, however you want to do it. You want to do it that way first? I'll, I'll talk about it. Sure. Yeah. So um, this policy has not been revised since June of 2007, um, and in that time, I've sat on some coaching interviews. I know Jackie's done some. You, Jody, didn't do any. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so it, it's <laughs> the Don't process for hiring a coach in the past has been um, at least one school board member, and they get people from the booster groups to come in and. Obviously, the athletics and activities director is there, um, so it's kind of a, a broad spectrum, but um, the feeling of the policy committee was we don't sit in on interviews for teachers, so why would the school board sit in on interviews for coaches when um, it seems like if we were going to sit in on interviews, we would that's all we would be doing, and we would have um, a lot more interviews to sit in on. And it's not that we don't want to be a part of these <laughs> sporting, um, the, the coaches' interviews, but it seemed um, like a strange exemption. So we have, um, in, the, in the revised policy that you have before you, we have removed um, the old 2.0 and just replaced it. And in that 2.0, it just talks about we want to make sure we hire well-qualified coaches and they need to have a background. And um, we have essentially just replace that with um, the new 2.0 that's proposed says each selection committee shall consist of no less than three members appointed by the superintendent or his or his, his or her designee, it says of, but should be or. Um, so it's just, it simplifies it, so a school board member could be one of those people, but it doesn't have to be. And um, sometimes that was a challenge to find a school board member that had the time in their schedule to sit on these coaching interviews, which could take up to a half a day or multiple days um, to make sure all the rounds of interviews were, were completed and done fairly if, 
it's an extensive process. I was, I was um, it's very orderly and there's a lot of steps to it, but it does take a lot of time. So um, school board members don't always have that extra time in the middle of a day to to um, to give to that. So that is really one of the only changes we've made at this point. Um, I don't know if we want to have a motion and then we can. Yeah. Do you want to provide a motion? Sure. Um, so I would uh, move approval of GCBC as a first reading as presented. Second. Discussion? Questions? Jackie? First of all, uh, I think there's a typo in that new yeah. statement. And you found that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to amend the emotion uh, that one of the three members should be a member of the Board of Education for the following reasons. First, coaches have more public exposure than do most of our administrators. Two, a board member can assure candidates that our selection process is fair and unbiased. It is anyway, but I think a board member assures that. Three, a board member can assure candidates that our interest is to develop and educate young people and that athletics is one part of that process. And lastly, number four, candidates will know that sports activities are supported by the Board of Education. So we have an amendment on the floor now. So um, as a point of order, is this a friendly amendment or one that we vote on. Are you proposing a friendly amendment or are you proposing a formal amendment? I'm proposing that we amend this policy that one of the three members appointed by the superintendent or his or her designee be a member of the Board of Education. I have a question. Sorry. Well, we don't have a can second can on I? that. No. If it's a friendly amendment, then the people who presented it have to accept it. If not, the entire board has to vote on it. So it's your choice what kind of an amendment you're proposing. Yes, I'm proposing that we vote on it. Can I, I have one question. If this is a first reading, isn't this something that you could take up in the policy committee? Or are we trying to? You could. I, that's just my question. Because you could, but Jackie, we've done that Jackie's in the past. proposing okay. an amendment. So, so I think that okay. uh, Mrs. Billy needs to recognize that and uh, see if there's any traction on her amendment. I'll second her amendment so we can discuss it. Discussion? Yes. Okay. So, second. All right. Discussion? <laughs> um, am I understanding, so you're saying you don't want to change this policy because the change is taking out the fact that a school board member has to sit on the committee? Well, it's taking out a lot of other things, but yeah, that is one of, the, one of the items that was removed, uh, and I think that uh, from my perspective, that it is, would be important if a board, I wouldn't want to hold up the process, but I think it's important that, that a board person be there. One of my aims in, in doing this is to ascertain two things. One, that the person understands the place that athletics has in the education of our children, of our students. And number two, that it is a total community supportive effort on behalf of athletics and, and activities for our students. It, we pay a lot of money, you've heard me say this before, in this community for athletics. And, and I think that, that that shows a commitment. Therefore, I think that, that a board person should be part of that commitment in the hiring of people who are out there in front of the public more so than our teachers and our administrators. Christine? Oh. Uh, okay. I mean, it says of coaches and advisors. I mean, granted, we approve advisors that come forward to us that are part of our group, but we don't sit on the committee to decide, you know, if Principal Creech and Mr. Legage, it, who they choose to be the advisor of the debate team. 
you know, we don't sit on like a committee for that. So, and I understand, you know, that the coaches are out there in the public a lot, but the advisors are as well, working with our students. I just, I'm not sure I fully Buddy? agree. Oops, sorry. Ha has anyone asked Mr. Legage his feelings on the importance of it being a school board member? I, m my personal feeling is that he knows more about what those coaches need to do in the in the task that they are put forth to to proceed with but is i don't understand what validity a school board member on that committee does in changing that dynamic can i say something um, i i don't want to put mr legage on the spot um so i i can speak okay. to what I believe that we would, how we would weigh in on this. Um, um, I think that we would um, pleasantly disagree with Ms. Perry. Um, this is unprecedented. Um, it is, it, you will not find this, as far as I know, in any other school district where there is a mandate, a policy mandate that a board member sit on the selection of someone who is um, engaged with us in one of the weakest contractual um, arrangements that we that we have, and by that I mean it is it is an appointment. It can happen today. It can be dissolved tomorrow. Um, whereas once we make a commitment, an employment commitment, for example, to a, to an ed tech, that is a more significant um, employment connection that we have. Than a than a, a, a contracted uh, a contracted um, coach or an advisor. So it it seems it seems a disproportionate um, engagement of the board for sort of the least um, significant, if you will. Obviously, I'm not saying that our coaches are anyone is insignificant, but least significant in terms of the employment relationship that we have. Um, it's, and again, I, I, I see Mr. Legage uh, nodding, so I, I suspect that he agrees with that. Any further discussion? I, I would just say yes. um, I <coughs> don't support the amendment, but I will say that I understand um, Jackie's uniquely qualified to sit on a lot of these interviews because of her background as a phys ed teacher and as a coach for many years, but I don't think... <laughs> any of the rest of us necessarily have that background. So to make that a policy requirement, I think, is making a policy that is specific to um, this, you know, the exact situation and time frame that we're in right now. Um, and I, there's nothing to say she couldn't be one of the, you know, or any one of us couldn't be invited to be as a part of that, that team. But I just, um, I just think there's a lot of I mean, there's so many hiring decisions that are made that we're not a part of. I just find this to be a strange exemption. Any other comments before we vote? Okay, they're voting on the amendment. On the amendment. And we're voting on the amendment at this time. So, all in favor of the amendment as presented by Jackie Perry. One, all against. Oh, my God. <laughs> Six plus two. Right. The amendment fails. The amendment fails. So you're going to go back to the original. So now we go back to the original amendment. Yes. I just have a clarifying question. Could you talk a little bit about why the line, because the relationship between teaching, coaching, and advising, it will be the school department's practice to secure coaches and advisors to the extent practicable from its teaching staff. Can you say why that was stricken? So part of what we've been doing to update the policy manual is to take out aspirational things that are not enforceable by policy. So we are trying to streamline the manual. We're trying to make it very um, readable, very usable, very um, understandable so somebody can immediately know how to follow it. So um, that's what just a, one of the things we're, we're trying to do. And that was, and so for us that most of this paragraph is sort of um, unenforceable as a policy. So we're just streamlining where we can and that was seemed to us one of the places where we could 
shrink it right down. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor of the motion as stated on the first reading for policy GCBC to be accepted as the first reading. Yeah, so I will fix that before the second reading. The, the, we're talking about the typo. Yeah. There is yeah, one typo right. on there, but yeah. We will fix All in favor? Seven plus two. So it passes for our first reading. And we'll be seeing this again in the near future. Yeah. 11.3, the backpack donation, Dr. Entwistle? Yes, is um, a wonderful note that I got from Kate that I believe that she shared with you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was to inform all of us that Heather and Brian P Paquette have made a generous donation to the School Nutrition Backpack Program in the amount of $1,000. Because Mr. Paquette is a UNAM employee, there's also a matching grant available for this donation. Um, as you all know, Kate states, uh, the Backpack Program delivers non-perishable food to students in need um, and their families so that our neighbors do not go hungry over the school breaks. The, the Paquettes have been strong supporters of the program and we are very grateful for their contribution. Um, we respectfully request that the school board approve acceptance of this donation, which will then be um, uh, a, a double donation, to, uh, so it would be $2,000. Move approval as presented with great thanks to the PACS. Second. Second. Any discussion or comments? Yes, Jackie? I just want to point out that, that uh, and Kelly's been involved with this mm -hmm. as, as, as I have been through Ko Kiwanis, and uh, this program is supported by funds other than school funds. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only contribution that the school makes is that the personnel do in fact put the food together because of the confidentiality issues. Qantas has volunteered, by the way, to do that and has been told thank you, but no thanks because of confidentiality. <coughs> so, uh, Kelly, we may not have to go after much food this year. I think well, we always, always do. Yeah. Always food is expensive. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No. Anyone else? No, I just think it's an amazing donation, and I love that Unum matches it. That's going to go a really long way. And um, I know it's sometimes... It's easier for people to shop. It's a tangible thing. It's easy to take your kids and go and buy the food because you know exactly what kids want to eat when you bring your kids with you. But um, the cash donations are incredibly important because the school employees can buy food at such a reduced rate that it goes a lot further sometimes. And when I bring in a box of Cheerios, they can take it and buy you know wholesale prices. So it makes a big difference when they do get the cash donation. So. Thank you very much for that. All in favor of this? Seven plus two. And we'll make sure a thank you letter goes out to the packet. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. And 11.4, a motion to approve the July 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2018 bargaining contract of the Scarborough Custodians and the Scarborough Food Service Specialists. So move. Second. Any discussion? Any questions? Do you want me to do any? Please. I'll, I'll just do the highlights. Uh, <coughs> first of all, we have restructured the cafeteria workers. There will be three kitchen managers, one at the three big schools, high school, middle school, and Wentworth. And we have elim eliminated the uh, custodial supervisor and we'll be having lead custodians. And at the moment we don't know what the lead custodian uh, piece will look like. We are in, the, Norm's in the process, Norm, uh, Todd is in the process of doing uh, job description for that. Uh, we have clarified meetings 
uh, attendance uh, during the school day. We have clarified what is a paid break and that custodians and, uh, cannot leave the building on a paid break. Uh, there is a different structure concerning vacation in that uh, new hires uh, will have fewer vacation days than current employees. And we have clarified uh, custodial positions when it comes to weather regulated school cancellations. Those are the big features that we have worked out. Anything else? Yes. I just want to make one point of clarification. Um, the position of custodial supervisor was not, um, there's no person doing that job currently, correct? It was not like we didn't right. eliminate a, a job for a person. This um, it was by attrition, and so the restructuring comes following that. Um, that job was just o open, so. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> well, let me just thank the team that worked on this. It's been a long time. Has this been like four years of work? Or? Yes. yes. And so uh, Mrs. Murphy and Mrs. Massengill and... Mm -hmm. Assistant you. Superintendent, Mrs. Sizemore, yeah. all worked on with us as we negotiated with the cafeteria and cafeteria workers and custodians. So we're all going to miss those meetings. Kelly can hardly <laughs> wait. <laughs> we'll have our time with the teachers. It'll be okay. We'll fill the void. Well, it's it's hard work and it's good work and I appreciate it and I'm glad we're moving moving forward with our custodians and food service workers. So, let's see, all in favor? Yes. All right, seven plus two. Thank you. And finally, we have a 12.0. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Seven point two. We are returned. Thank you.